We pray that the ministry of music today has already been an encouragement to you and that the word of God will now be an encouragement to us. Our scripture today continues to be from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, and we begin today with chapter 3, verse 4, and uh, read to the end of the chapter. And I'd like to make a few remarks about the scripture as I read it, and then we'll come specifically to the message for today, which really arises out of the last verse. Verse 4 of chapter 3, Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God, not that we are competent to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. Here, it's good to know that uh, we can't have a feeling of competence and ability, but we recognize, as Paul does, that all competence and ability and confidence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, a covenant. Paul in this passage is comparing the new with the old covenant. A covenant in the scripture is different than a contract. In a contract which we sign, we sit down, two equal parties sit down and negotiate a deal, whether it's the sale of a house or a car or a piece of property or something like that. But a covenant in the scripture is made by a superior to an inferior. It is equivalent to a last will and testament. That is, the one who makes it has absolute control over the terms of what is made. And the one who is the inferior simply has no power to alter or change the covenant in any respect his only ability is to decide whether to receive or reject the covenant. Paul is saying an old covenant was made at Sinai with Moses, which came with great glory, but it had certain limitations. Now, in Jesus Christ, a new covenant has been made. New, there are two words in the Greek for new, one new in point of time, and the other new, not only in point of time, but new in quality, like there's never been anything like it before. When you get a new car, you get one that's new in point of time, but it's like all the other cars, it has four wheels and a motor and a windshield, you know. But the new covenant is something that has never been before, a whole new thing. And Paul saying to these Corinthians who were being enchanted with persons who were wanting to return them to legalism and to Judaism with a Christian flavor, he's saying to them, no, you've already got a new covenant. It's a better covenant. The Old Covenant had a letter to it, but we've got the covenant of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry that brought death, the word ministry is literally the word deacon, that is, the function of the Old Covenant was to serve out death to people. How did it do that? Because if you tried to keep the old law at Sinai, you found you always failed. You could never completely keep God's law, so you were always failing, and that ministered death. The soul that sinneth shall die. But there also was with the old covenant the necessity of animal sacrifice. And every year there were 1,000, I tried to add them up in my own way, 1,191 animals slain just for the sins of the nation as a whole, excluding individual personal sacrifices that would have been offered that would have numbered into the tens of thousands a year. The Old Covenant brought death. It was engraved in letters on stone, that is, it was external, but it came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was. Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory the old covenant is like the moon when the sun comes out. It fades from view. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect or behold the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, 
who is the Spirit. My message this morning, really drawn more from verse 18, is simply titled, How to Keep a Shining Face. I think my face became a matter of concern to me this week when the dermatologist burns some things off of it. So I have have a fixation on shining faces. My wife is always telling me that I show my feelings in my face. She can look at the platform and tell if anything's wrong with me just by looking at me even from a distance. A lot of us are like that, aren't we? We show our feelings in our face. Verse 18 tells us that we with unveiled faces are all beholding and reflecting the Lord's glory. That would suggest, as we look at Jesus, a face that is filled with his radiance, a shining face. And maybe your face doesn't feel all that shining with Christ's glory today. I thought about that as I pondered that title, How to Keep a Shining Face, and it seemed to me that there are some things that can come along that dim the shine on a Christian's face if we let, let them. One certainly is hardships. Hardships. Facing a lot of stress, pressure, economic problems, health problems, circumstantial problems, friendship problems, the whole like hardships. Someone in the congregation commented that they, they've been a Christian less than a year, and it seems like more bad things have happened to them since they become a Christian than their whole lifetime before they became a Christian, including getting very seriously ill, losing their job, a few other things, good things like that. And uh, I realize that can dim the shine on our face. You know, those kinds of things are going to happen to us whether we become Christians or not, in a sense. And I think the difference is that with Christ, we can face those in a much different way than we could have faced the same circumstances without him. But hardships can certainly put a kind of a, a troubled look on our face. Another thing that can dim the shine on our face is self-gratification outside of God's will. That's simply a fancy phrase for sin. <laughs> sin is self-gratification outside God's will. It's reaching out to please yourself in a way that is not approved by the Lord. And certainly when there is clear known sin in our life, it it keeps our spiritual visage at a, at a dimmer wattage. Persecution can cause the shine to dim in some people, not necessarily in all, but uh, when you're under a heavy gun of peer pressure or if you're living in a country where there is strong pressure even against being a Christian, that can produce a very a dejected kind of look. I think seduction, Subtle ways that the enemy seduces away from purity and simplicity in our faith can produce a lack of a shining face. This is, appears to be the problem at Corinth. There had been those who came to the church at Corinth and ministered and were persons who had a strong legalistic emphasis in their messages, returning people to the law, away from grace. And Paul's having to write to correct that. And persons that began living a law-oriented life, how well am I doing in terms of pleasing God by every, uh, every requirement that he's given can become very cast down. Being critical and judgmental can dim the light on our face. Having a good, hot time chewing somebody out can dim the light on our face. You know, as I say that, I, I can't help but recalling just uh, six or eight weeks ago when we were in Cairo, Egypt, there was the how can I say it? The guy behind the hotel desk tried to cheat me out of $56. He cheated me out of $56, in fact, because he wouldn't let our party go catch the, the airplane that morning and, and until I paid it. And he pulled the, made sure the luggage was pulled off the bus until I paid it. Flat out cheated me. I'd been in Egypt two days. I'd seen how they bartered in the marketplace. And I, for a moment, instead of becoming Pastor George Wood, became marketplace bazaar-oriented. And, you know, the bazaar could be spelled two ways. You wouldn't have believed me thumping the table and yelling. There was no light on my face in that particular moment. It's amazing how when we get critical and judgmental, how the light on our face dims. I watched some faces, and I have this ability to forget uh, concrete things, so don't anybody necessarily think I had you singled out, because I absolutely had no one singled out. But... Remember last Sunday, the 8.30 service ran late, and it ran the Sunday school late, and it ran the auditorium late, and everybody was backed up in the parking lot and the foyer and everything getting in, and, and wow, you could feel a little bit of tension. That's why I said we're giving a fruit of the Spirit test today, and the fruit we're looking for is patience. But you know, uh, when that happens to us, we become critical and judgmental and enter a worship service in that attitude. 
it affects us, the whole worship service. It affects the altar response. It affects what, how free the Spirit is to even minister to us. I don't think maybe that will never happen again where we'll get stacked up, but if it does, uh, use that occasion to meet uh, new people, to extend warm friendship, uh, to not let an adverse circumstance dim the light of the glow of the Lord Jesus on our faces. The devil always likes to sneak up on us and catch us even in our most spiritual moments. That's what's perverse about temptation. Except temptation just as doesn't hit people that are out in the gutter, so to speak. It hits the most spiritually pious people. I'm reminded, speaking of the devil slipping up on us, of the story that Ray Stedman told about two students at Duke University in North Carolina who were invited to a masquerade party. And they decided to go dressed in the costumes of the mascots of Duke University, the Blue Devils. So they rented Blue Devil costumes. And dressed in these, they started out for the party, and without realizing it, they got mixed up and went by mistake into a church congregation at prayer meeting on a Friday night. And when these people looked up from their prayers and saw these two blue devils walking in, man, people were peeling out the windows and the doors, you know, it's left and right. And this one little uh, kind of a stout lady got wedged in the front pew and couldn't get out. And these, she started screaming in terror. And these two young men, forgetting for a moment that they were the ones causing this problem and forgetting that they were in a blue devil outfit, rushed forward to try to help her. And she just panicked when she saw them coming. And she rolled her eyes and said, raised her hand and said, stop, stop. Don't go any further. I want you to know that I've been a member of this church for 25 years and I've been on your side all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, you know, in my own life, a few times the Spirit has let me know very clearly what side I was on, and sometimes it's upsetting me. People disappointments can, be, uh, can keep the light of the Lord from glowing on our face. Wow, we really looked to a person, and they failed us. Maybe a fellow member of the body, maybe a member of family, maybe an example we really looked to, and they let us down. And loneliness, too can really cause a lot of dejection on the face. How do you keep the shine on your face and even see it becoming brighter? Well, there are three little steps, I think, that are here in the chapter that we've read today. First one is simply this. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Surest way I know to reflect the image of the Lord Jesus Christ in your face is to look at him. We behold his face as in a mirror is literally what Paul is saying. And as we behold his face, we are in turn reflecting the face we see. When I look in a mirror, the mirror is reflecting back to me the face I see. And that's the idea that Paul is advancing in this text. As we look into the personality of Jesus Christ, what we mirror back is the personality of Jesus. Now we recognize that when we say look at Jesus, there is no physical description we have of Jesus from the New Testament. We have no idea what physically he looked like. But we know what his character was like. And we know that if we can keep looking at that character and saying, Lord, change me into that kind of character, God will do that work in our life. As a result of our trip to the Holy Land, there was some unfinished business that needed to be taken care of with a small airline that we had needed to get some refund of some tickets on. And they had been rather slow in the refund, and I was getting very concerned. And I found out that uh, they were having cash flow problems. And their refund delays were about four or five months in coming. And uh, I began worried that then maybe they were going to go bankrupt like some of the other smaller airlines that have gone recently. Became very concerned. And I was uh, prepared to go up to the office and uh, really give them a talk on business ethics and how important it was to build their company on solid business foundations. And if they wouldn't uh, pay me pronto, they're on the spot. Uh, I would uh, use their name and tell everybody not to ever fly with them, and, uh, and we would, you know, take them to court. After all, they're not a Christian company, and I can do this. And, and I thought, boy, we'll just do some of those Egyptian techniques that work so well in Cairo, you know. And uh, the day I was to go up, uh, I had been in the back of my mind working with a new concept that uh, in, in, in a prayer group that uh, Ray Ortland and some others had in, uh, uh, our, and I are involved in a, a once a month. They had been talking in that prayer group about frontal praying, which is praying before you do something. Maybe you're great at some of a lot of what I do. I make plans and then I pray the Lord to bless them. 
But frontal praying is praying seriously about a matter before you go do something about it and getting the Lord's direction before you go charging off. And the Lord, I felt impressed upon me about 4 o'clock in the morning as I woke up, the fact that I needed to go there that day and be George Wood Christian and George Wood pastor and not uh, George Wood pounding the table kind of a person. And the Lord gave me real peace. That, that that's what I, I was just to go up and be very very gentle and prayerful for this company. They were in a lot of trouble and they needed prayer. And so I went up and the girl that uh, was in charge of community relations came out and I talked to her. Right away I could sense she stiffened as I told her why I was there. And then uh, we talked some more and out of the conversation came the fact that her grandfather is a pastor. Um, we talked some more and I shared some more details and Ultimately, she said, we'll do what we can, and she arranged a very satisfactory conclusion for the whole matter. And at the end of that conversation with her, I said, you know, I came up here, and I've been sitting in this lobby for some time, and I, I realized the switchboard operator and the people inside that door are under an awful lot of pressure, getting this new company off the ground and dealing with all the customer complaints that are happening. I said, I just want to volunteer that if you would like a pastor to come up some morning before work, and uh, to pray for everybody, I'd be glad to pray that God will give you blessing as a company and help you. And the Lord shared with me that I should at least make that offer. She said, well, I don't know if everybody else will do that. She said, but you can pray for me. Turned out this girl is, is a real Christian girl. And I could have gone up there and just, you know, been doing this, never found out she was a Christian. And besides, I would have never had any satisfaction to what I came for anyway. And I was so glad that in that particular moment, the Holy Spirit had impressed upon me to keep my eyes on Jesus in that situation and go up there and behave like Jesus would behave instead of behaving like I wanted to behave in my natural self. You know, when we fail, and I suspect that there are people in this room that have failed God even this week, it helps too to keep our eyes on Jesus because if we get our eyes on ourself and our failure and all the people are looking at us and maybe some people know about our failure and say, you failed, we can get our eyes on ourselves and upon the people that are looking at us and get them off Jesus. And if we get them off Jesus, then we can't be changed into his glory. When I fail, keeping my eyes on Jesus means I know I have someone I can turn to. Paul says we're to contemplate, we're to behold the Lord and we're to reflect him. How to have a shining face. First, keep your eyes on Jesus. Second step, keep your eyes on Jesus. That's the first step and that's the second step. Keep your eyes on Jesus. You become what you look at. You mirror what you contemplate. Stephen is being pelted with rocks, but his face is glowing like an angel's. Our faces will either mirror the face of Jesus or they will mirror our circumstances. The faces looking at Stephen in Acts chapter 7 were gnashing their teeth and grating at him. But he was smiling back with the radiance of Christ because he had chosen not to mirror his circumstances, but to let his face mirror that of the Lord. Perhaps you're familiar with or remember Nathaniel Hawthorne's story about the great stone face. A little lad lived in a village where there was a mountain with a rock formation which they called the great stone face. And the people had a legend that someday someone would come to their village who would look like the great stone face. He would do wonderful things for the village and he would be a means of great blessing and somehow that story, the legend of the stone face, took hold upon that little boy living in that village. During his lifetime he would gaze at that great stone face many, many times, every opportunity he had and he would dream that someday somebody would come to his town with a great stone face and be a blessing and do good works for the villagers. Years passed and as time went by the young boy became a young man and became a middle-aged man and finally he became an old man and he was tottering down the street one day when someone looked up and saw him coming by and shouted he has come the man who looks like the great stone face has come this man had looked into the stone face for so long that in Hawthorne's story he finally bore the image of what he had looked like and looked at and so we as Paul says as we behold the face of Jesus are likewise being changed. I mentioned my message today had three points of how to have a shiny face. I'm going to be like the country preacher who stood up when he began to preach and said, folks, today my sermon has three points. First, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to say. 
Second, I'm going to say it. And third, I'm going to tell you what I said. And so my three points today are to keep a shining face. One, keep your eyes on Jesus. Two, keep your eyes on Jesus. Three, keep your eyes on Jesus. This does not involve our putting on an artificial mask. It doesn't involve us just uh, sort of doing facial exercises to have the Christian goody look. In fact, we are told that Moses, with the fading glory of the law, used to speak to the people with his veil off, and then when he went back in, he would put the veil on and come back out when he wasn't speaking, and the people wouldn't see the fact that his face was dimming. And Moses kept the veil on, and evidently until all the glory was gone. It was like the people couldn't handle a messenger whose glory was fading. And so he wore a mask, wore a mask so they couldn't see the fading glory. And that is often the case in our own Christian experience. We, we keep a mask on to hide what may be really happening inside of us, the fading glory. Moses looked in his mirror one day and said, Oh boy, yesterday my wattage was 250 watts in my face. Today it's down to 245 and it's probably going down every day, you know. Masks. So he kept the veil on. But we as believers have the freedom, Paul says, to take the veil off so that people can see the stages of our transformation. When I was preparing for a ministry, it was impressed upon me subtly that ministers, especially of all people, should never be vulnerable, should never share their weak points or where they've gone wrong or anything like that. They always project an image of perfection, which we are, of course, when we represent the Word of God. So it's been difficult for me to switch gears and get into Paul's method here for Christians that we ought to be vulnerable and transparent enough with one another so that people can see our growth progress over a period of time. We have the courage to take the mask off, to be seen as we really are, and we're being changed from glory to glory. The word transformed here is a fascinating word. Used in verse 18, we are being transformed into his likeness. In the Greek, it's the same word that is used in the Gospels for the transfiguration of Jesus. It means literally, it is literally the word in the Greek, metamorphosis. It describes the process that happens when a tadpole becomes a frog. It is going through metamorphosis. It is changing form or structure. Morphosis from morphe, meaning form or structure. The word refers to Jesus at the transfiguration when his eternal form of God shone through his humanity. And it's used of believers twice, Romans 12, 2, and here in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, to describe the change that's coming in our nature as well. Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. The word he uses for conformed is not, not metamorphosis. It's the word schema, which means scheme or fashion. And the word which he uses for being transformed in the renewing of our mind is to literally change form or structure. And there's an important difference between the two words. Because the Greek said schema is something outward that is changing, but morphe is something that is eternal and unalterable and basic. When I look at myself in a mirror, I see that my schema is different today than it was some 30 years ago when I had curly red hair. And my schema is going to continue to change as I get older, the outward man. But my morphe has always been male, and it will always be male, basic structure. And so Paul, in writing to us in Romans 12, 2, says, don't be conformed to this world, or Philip says, don't let the world squeeze you in its mold, because its mold changes. What, what people outside of Christ think is right today will disagree with what's right, what they think is right tomorrow. Things are passing away, but you have an essential, an essential basic change in your nature. And what, the, what we are being told in a Christian life is that beginning with new birth, that essential change in our nature takes place. And we are being transformed from people who bore the image of Adam to people who bear the image of Christ. And we're on a journey of transformation. Our nature is being altered. Sometimes younger people who are filled with idealism and what a real Christian should be may look at the failure of some older Christian and say, oh, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. Well, you wouldn't. If a tadpole in the process of becoming a frog doesn't look like a tadpole or a frog, you wouldn't say that tadpole is being a big hypocrite. It doesn't know whether it's a tadpole or a frog. You would look at it and you'd say, I know that that thing, whatever it is right now, is in the process of change. 
And that's exactly what's happening with us as believers. We're in the process of change. And you can find me sometimes in my life, and I may look more like Adam's child than Christ's child. And I may find you in some moments, and you may look that way too. But over a period of time, as we continue to behold the face of Jesus Christ, his personality and the like, we are being transformed into his likeness, metamorphosized into his nature, so that just as we have borne the image of the man of earth, we'll also bear the image of the man from heaven. A few years ago, oh my, it's been over maybe a dozen years now, we took our children to Camp Seeley for the very first time. Camp Seeley Family Bible Camp in the summer, which is a tradition with our family, and it's one of the neatest things we've ever had the privilege of doing as a family, year after year. George was three and Evangeline was five. We didn't know what Camp Seeley was like, and so the kids were dressed in clean, new, white t-shirts, white shorts, white shoes, and white socks. It took all of 10 minutes to realize that we had made a tragic mistake, but those kids, I remember them in the back seat, so excited about going to camp for the first time. I mean, they're, I, I just radiate today, just thinking about those little kids in the back seat. And then, so I was driving up the mountain one of the last times we went up to Camp Seeley for our summer week up there. Look, there's a couple teenagers, you know. And I got to thinking about the first time they went up. Weren't they cute when they were three and five? And weren't they great when they were seven and nine? And they were special when they were 11 and 13. But now, you know, I don't want to fit them back into the three and five year olds as, as neat as that age was. I'm, I look at them and I like where they are at today. And I said to myself, over the years as we've driven up to Camp Seeley, these kids are metamorphosizing. They're being transformed in age and appearance. And I think our Heavenly Father looks at us the same way, looks at our early days, maybe if you've been a Christian for a while, looks at when we first came to Christ and there's a joy and a beauty and a freshness and an innocence about that. But he also sees us now, wherever you're at in that journey. And Father is glad that you've committed yourself to looking at the face of Jesus Christ. And you've committed yourself to changing into his nature. And that just as surely as it is built into the genetic genes that a tadpole is going to become a frog, so just as sure God has built that into your spiritual makeup as well. That you, he's not going to be content with you. And you're not going to be content with yourself. And he's not going to be finished with you until you've become like his son, Christ Jesus. Keep a shining face. Keep looking at Jesus. And you'll become like what you look at. Our Father, we thank you that step by step you are transforming us from glory into glory. We thank you for the freedom of the gospel, which means we don't have to wear some artificial mask but that we can look at Jesus and he can look at us. And even in the moments when we don't feel like looking at him because we have made such a virile failure in our life, and maybe there are people here that made bad failures this last week. Oh, Lord, we take this service and these closing moments to focus our eyes upon you. And we say, Lord, my problem came because my eyes got off you. And now, Lord, don't let my problem be compounded by thinking that in my failure I must keep my eyes away from you. Help me, Lord, today to turn my eyes to Jesus. Lord, there are people in this congregation that are facing real severe problems and stresses related to finances and problems within family, health problems. We can look at all these things, Lord, and in the natural, we can become very discouraged. So it's important that we take this moment to again redirect our gaze to you. We know there's always hope in you. There's always glory in you. Your plans for us are not for evil, but for good. To give us a purpose and a hope. We're thankful for the changes you're working out in our life, even through adversity. You're working out changes in us. We're glad that you're changing us. We're glad that that's the responsibility of the Spirit. We're delighted to go along with his wishes. Live in us, Lord. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen.